On the 15th of August 1945, the Japanese Empire capitulated after the United States threw atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was the last country of the Axis powers that continued its war, and as such, with its surrender, the Second World War came to an end. On the 2nd of September, the formal signing of the treaty aboard the USS Missouri reaffirmed this. Even though Japan had formally surrendered and the preparations were made to both rebuild the Japanese mainland and put on trial the men responsible for this deadly conflict, it did not mean the war had ended for all Japanese soldiers. As a matter of fact, some soldiers took their mission to never surrender, quite literally, a bit too literally. Today is about the last Japanese soldier to lay down his weapons and surrender after the Second World War. Whereas the last German unit surrendered in September 1945, a bit over half a year after the war ended, the Japanese took it to a whole new level. Right, so the last Japanese soldier to surrender was Hiro Onoda. He was born in 1922 in Japan into a family that had roots with the old samurai. His father was a sergeant in the Japanese cavalry and was killed in China in 1943. When Hiro was 17 years old, he started working at a firm in China, but not for long, because soon he was drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army. He wasn't just drafted as a regular soldier, but was sent to a special academy, the Nakano School, where soldiers were explicitly trained in guerrilla warfare. On the 26th of December 1944, it was evident, even to the Japanese, that they were fighting a losing battle. Hiro, together with his command unit, was sent to the Philippine island of Lubang. The unit received orders to, together with the Japanese soldiers already on the island, wage guerrilla warfare against the approaching Americans. As the unit was preparing to leave, the division commander added another explicit order. Under no circumstances should they commit suicide. You see, it was custom that Japanese soldiers, once they realized defeat was imminent, committed suicide or died in a suicide charge on the enemy. So it wasn't a random order, the commander actually wanted the division to fight to the bitter end instead of taking their own lives when the war was over, something that was considered honorable in Japanese culture. The division was tasked with charging against enemy landing ships and blowing up the pier at the harbor, but when they arrived on the island, they found the Japanese troops that were already there utterly discouraged and without morale. The garrison commanders refused to help Hiro and his men, and Hiro lacked the seniority to order them to. This lack of action eventually translated to Allied forces landing on the island. In the ensuing four-day battle, the Allied troops overran and conquered the island by February 1945. The surviving Japanese didn't surrender, though. Those that weren't captured split up in groups of three to four and made their way inland to hide in the mountains and jungle and wage their guerrilla warfare as they had been trained to do. As the months passed by, eventually only Hiro remained together with corporals Shoichi Shimada and the soldiers Kinchikichi Kozuka and Yuchi Akatsu. They lived in the wilderness foraging for their food and sleeping in makeshift huts. The men quite literally only had their clothes and their weapons with an apparent shortage of ammunition. Their diet wasn't very varied since the natural vegetation of the island only provided bananas and coconuts. Now they didn't just stay on the island for months. These men remained there for years on end, occasionally carrying out their guerrilla tactics in skirmishes with adventurers, Philippine soldiers and any person that happened to come close. All in all, the message that Japan had surrendered in August 1945 never reached them. By 1949, one of Hiro's men, Akatsu, deserted. After an entire unit of 41 men, led by Corporal Fujita close by, had surrendered earlier that year. Now keep in mind, the war had been over for four years by now. Hiro and the two remaining soldiers carried out many sabotage attacks and guerrilla skirmishes. They burned rice supplies from the local population and they tried to get as much territory as possible under their control, in Hiro's words, to clear the way for the Japanese landing party that we continued to expect. The burning of rice stocks were thought of as signals to Japanese troops that might have been close to the island in order for them to notice the Onoda squadron was still alive and carrying on the fight. In reality, Philippine soldiers, United States soldiers and even the local population was getting very fed up with these Japanese guerrillas or hill devils as they called them that refused to surrender years after the war had ended. 
For years, Hiro, together with soldier Kozuka, continued their attacks and raids on the local population until in 1972, Kozuka was killed in a firefight with island police. The death of Kozuka, instead of making Hiro willing to surrender, only made him hide better and carry out his raids and attacks more diligently and better prepared. Now, it wasn't like authorities didn't try to get these men out of their last stand mentality, unresponsive to the fact the war had ended. Since they knew soldiers remained on the island during the 1950s and 60s, authorities left pamphlets, letters and newspapers spread around the jungle to try and convince soldiers that the war was over. They even used megaphones to broadcast to the wilderness that the war was over, using family members of soldiers they knew were in there. In 1959, Hiro's brother even made a statement asking him to surrender. Hiro was convinced of prisoner of war that looked like his brother was forced to read a statement. His belief the war was still going on was only strengthened when Akatsu, who they deemed a deserter, led a broadcast to his former comrades in arms, telling them the war had ended and the Philippine army had received him with dignity. Pictures of his parents and brothers were left. Still, he thought they were faked and oftentimes he refused to believe the letters by his family were real because of supposed spelling mistakes or weird vocabulary such as Onoda's son instead of just Onoda. Hiro was thoroughly convinced Japan was winning the war, and the Japanese battalion to carry out the attack on the island could arrive any day. Okay, so there's another part why it is understandable Hiro thought the war was continuing. He often heard bombs go off in the distance. What Hiro didn't know was that his hiding location was very close by a training ground for the Philippine Air Force, and he heard exercise bombing raids. So in 1972, both Kozuka died, and another Japanese soldier, Sergeant Soichi Yokoi, was retrieved from the island of Guam. Because of his appearance after 28 years, the Japanese authorities increased their search efforts for Hiro. They assumed him to be the last soldier, if not one of the last remaining soldiers. More letters were dropped, and sound recordings of his brother and sister were broadcast in the jungle to get him to come out. According to Hiro, he knew the enemy could manipulate voices, as they had done earlier with his brother in 1959. And here's where it gets interesting. Nothing seemed to work until a university dropout that wanted to go on an adventure, Norio Suzuki, decided to go look for Hiro. The young man stated his goal was as follows. He wanted to find Onoda, a panda, and the abominable snowman, which he meant the yeti with. Norio went to the island and set up camp in terrain that was known to be controlled by Hiro. This way, he forced a meeting, and when Hiro appeared, he asked him what was necessary to convince him the war had ended. Hiro told Norio he would only surrender if an official order came from his commander. Norio relayed his message to the Japanese authorities, and fortunately, one of Hiro's former commanders was still alive. As such, on the 9th of March 1974, one of his old commanders, Major Taniguchi, flew to the island and met with Hiro and gave him the order to surrender. Suddenly, Hiro's make-believe world of the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere collapsed. Hiro later said about this that when he was alone, he believed the Imperial Japanese Empire that would never surrender. He said he was unable to respond psychologically to family members calling out to him. Not until he returned to Japan did he realize he had been living in a fantasy world and the Japanese Empire had been a figment of his imagination for decades. 29 years after Japan had surrendered, Hiro emerged from the jungle with his tattered clothing and gun. When he returned to Japan, he received a hero's welcome, but he himself could not enjoy it. For 30 years on Lubang, I polished my rifle every day. For what? I cursed myself. For 30 years, I thought I was doing something for my country, but now it seemed as though I had just caused a lot of people a lot of trouble. It is a very tragic story about a man that literally went beyond the call of duty. The Philippine government pardoned him for killing between 10 and 30 Philippine citizens. Even though Hiro was incredibly famous in Japan upon his return, he could not correctly reintegrate in Japanese society. He eventually emigrated to Brazil, married there, and wrote his autobiography, No Surrender. It became a bestseller worldwide. And during the 80s, Hiro returned to Japan in order to establish the Onoda Shizen Yuku, a sort of Boy Scout fraternity group throughout Japan that taught children survival skills in nature. In 1996, he returned to the island he had spent nearly 30 years of his life on. Hiro Onoda died in January 2014 at the age of 91. As for Norio Suzuki, the adventurous explorer, well, 
He continued exploring for a little while, but he met a tragic fate. He did manage to find a panda, but died in an avalanche as he was looking for a yeti in 1986 at the age of 37. And this is the disclaimer, but although Hiro was the last Japanese soldier to surrender, there was another Japanese holdout held by a Taiwanese volunteer, Teruo Nakamura, that held out several months longer than Hiro until December 1974. A surveillance aeroplane spotted his hideout by accident upon which contact was sought and he was repatriated to Taiwan. Thank you very much for watching this video. I would also like to thank all my patrons for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.